In this edition of Back in History, we take you back in time to the events that resulted in the invasion of the Entebbe International Airport in Uganda by Israeli Special Forces on a mission to rescue more than a hundred citizens of Israel who were in a France Air Bus that was diverted by hijackers and taken to Entebbe in Uganda. We discuss the participants in the hijack and the support given to them by the then government of Idi Amin. The evacuation of victims from the air balls by the hijackers into a building in the Entebbe airport. The demands of the hijackers for the release of their partners who were detained by the government of Israel. The conception of a plan to invade Entebbe airport at night and rescue the victims by application of force and the successful invasion of the airport by Israeli special forces which saw to the rescue of all the victims except a few that were shot. We also narrate the death of some Israeli soldiers in the course of the raid, in particular the death of Jonathan Netanyahu, elder brother to Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Welcome to this edition of Back in History. Entebbe is a city located close to the shores of Lake Victoria by central Uganda. In this city, there is an airport known as Entebbe International Airport. This airport was built between 1972 and 1973. The airport was simply serving its primary purpose of providing a base for takeoff and landing of aeroplanes until 27th June 1976 when it gained international notoriety. A passenger jetliner belonging to Air France and carrying 248 passengers was hijacked and diverted to the Ugandan airspace and landed at the Entebbe International Airport. The background to the story is that some militants were arrested and detained by the government of Israel in a number of locations. Some were also detained in other countries, but on the instruction of the Israeli government. Most of them were members of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine External Operations, PFLPEO. Others were members of affiliated militant groups. A good number of their members had been arrested and locked up by the government of Israel, and the remaining members of these militant groups sat back to discuss and plan the best possible way to secure the release of their members. They arrived at the conclusion to hijack a jetliner, having a good number of Israeli citizens as passengers, and to use these as a bargain for the release of their detained members. This is how the hijack of France Air Bus Flight 139 came about. The first takeoff point of the plane was Tel Aviv, the capital of Israel, and the final destination of the plane was Paris, capital of France. But the plane needed to stop over at Athens in Greece to pick some more passengers before continuing the journey. The passengers to be picked at Athens were 58 in number. Out of this number, an unknown to the airline, four of the passengers were hijackers. No one on board the flight knew their mission until the plane took off. At exactly 12.30 p.m., the plane departed Athens for France. Minutes after takeoff, the hijackers moved up to the cockpit and took over the plane. The hijackers were two Palestinians and two Germans. The hijackers immediately diverted the plane to Benghazi, capital of Libya, for refueling, and from Libya, it left for Entebbe in Uganda. At this point, it became clear and beyond doubt to the passengers and crew that all was not well. No one knew what would happen next. At exactly 3.15 p.m. of 29th June 1976, the plane landed in Entebbe. At Entebbe, the four hijackers that joined as passengers in Athens were joined by other members of the group. They were also supported by soldiers from the Ugandan army on the instruction 
of then President Idi Amin of Uganda. The passengers were evacuated from the plane into a large terminal building in the airport, which at the time was no more in use. They were heavily guarded and given commands on what to do and what not to do. The following day, Idi Amin visited them and promised to use his efforts to negotiate with the respective parties for their release. At this time, the hostages were seriously terrified and no one had a clear indication of what exactly was awaiting them in the next minute or in the next hours. What was more terrifying to the hostages was the realization that the hijackers had the support of the president of the country where they were held hostage. The hijackers then made public their demands. First, they demanded the immediate release of 53 Palestinian and pro-Palestinian militants who were imprisoned on the orders of the government of Israel. Out of this number, 40 were imprisoned in Israel, while the rest were imprisoned in other countries on the orders of Israel. Their second demand was for the payment of the sum of 5 million US dollars as ransom. As of 1976, 5 million dollars was a huge sum of money. The hijackers threatened that if these demands were not met, they would begin to kill the hostages from July 1st, 1976. Meanwhile, the target of the hijackers was Israeli citizens, and for this reason, they decided to separate the Israelis from other hostages and kept them in two different halls. On 30th June 1976, the hijackers released 48 non-Israeli hostages, mainly the sick and elderly passengers, mothers and children. And the released passengers were flown in a chartered flight to Paris. As the deadline of 1st July drew closer, the government of Israel conveyed their decision to negotiate with the hijackers. For this reason, the hijackers extended the deadline to 4th July and released another group of 100 non-Israeli hostages. They said 100 non-Israeli hostages were flown back to Paris. The number of persons in captivity thus reduced to 106, including the crew members of the hijacked airbus. Diplomatic discussions were made at various levels, including reaching out to the host president, President Idi Amin, to assist in facilitating the release of the hostages. To no avail. The Israeli government also reached out to the United States government for the U.S. to reach out to the then Egyptian president Anwar Sadat to speak to his friend Idi Amin. All these efforts failed. Yasser Arafat, the then chairman of the PLO, was also consulted to offer his assistance. He sent his political aid to Uganda as a special envoy to negotiate with the hijackers and with Idi Amin but the hijackers refused to meet with him. Idi Amin also refused to meet with him. When all the diplomatic efforts failed, the Israeli government then thought of an alternative, the forceful invasion of Entebbe to secure the release of the captives. While the hijackers waited for the arrival of the deadline of July 4, the government of Israel was seriously planning for an invasion. A special team was quickly assembled, made up of the best hands in the Israeli armed forces and Mossad. Commanders were selected and given roles to carry out on air and on land. The ground task force numbered about 100 personnel and the command and control of this force was led by Brigadier General Dan Shamron. There was the assault unit which comprised of 29 armed personnel and this unit was led by Lieutenant Colonel Jonathan Netanyahu, brother to Benjamin Netanyahu, who later became the Prime Minister of Israel. It was this unit 
that was saddled with the primary responsibility of assaulting the old terminal building and rescuing the hostages. There were a few other units to support the attack. Mossad offered the needed intelligence for the mission. They spoke with the hostages that were released and got a perfect picture of the number of the hijackers, the weapons used by them, the location of the building, the involvement of the Ugandan soldiers, and many more. Information about the construction layout of the Entebbe International Airport was obtained from the Israeli company that constructed the airport years back for Uganda. A caricature building of the terminal where the hostages were held was quickly built to give the rescue personnel a clear picture of their target. Everything was set for the mission and every support of government and of the parliament was given. Time was of the critical essence and the commando team was ready and good to go. Note that the initial plan was for the Israeli Special Force to airlift highly experienced naval commandos and drop them into Lake Victoria. The commandos would then make their way to the airport, which is not far away from the lake. This plan was however abandoned when further information revealed that Lake Victoria was inhabited by crocodiles which had the propensity to swallow or destroy humans. The plan to invade Entebbe International Airport directly and move straight to where the hostages were detained was thus seen as the best possible option. The planes left Tel Aviv and successfully landed in Entebbe Airport. It is worthy of note that before embarking on the mission, research was made to know the exact type of vehicles usually driven in Idi Amin's convoy. They discovered that the president had a black Mercedes-Benz and Land Rover at all times in his convoy. These vehicles were quickly purchased and driven into the cargo plane and carried along with the soldiers for the mission. On touching down at Entebbe International Airport, the vehicles were driven out of the cargo plane and driven directly to the entrance of the terminal building where the hostages were kept. The reason for driving in vehicles that resembled the Diamin's vehicles was to give the impression to the security men that the president was inside the vehicles which would make it needless for any security checks at the gates. Inside the front vehicle was Lieutenant Colonel Jonathan Netanyahu, the commander of the assault troops. As they approached the gate of the terminal, two Ugandan soldiers who mounted guard at the gate ordered the vehicles to stop. Unknown to the Israelis, Idi Amin recently changed his vehicles and the security men at the gate were curious about the persons that were driving in. Stopping would have exposed the mission of the troops quite early. And what then happened was that the two soldiers who came out to interrogate the, the vehicles were shot with silenced pistols. The assault team then approached the terminal building quickly to execute their mission. The commandos gained access into the hall where the hostages were kept and immediately announced through megaphones thus, quote, Stay down, stay down, we are Israeli soldiers, end of quote. The commando shot all the hijackers, seven in number, and freed over 100 Israelis that were held in captivity. The rescued persons were quickly escorted by Israeli soldiers into their cargo aircraft, while the escort and loading of the hostages was ongoing, Ugandan soldiers became fully aware of what was going on and decided to shoot at the troops from the airport's control tower. At least five commandos were wounded in the process. It was also at this point that the unit commander, Lieutenant Colonel Jonathan Netanyahu, was shot and killed. The Israeli commandos fired back at the control tower 
and succeeded in suppressing Ugandan firepower. The Israelis finished with the evacuation of the hostages and loaded Netanyahu's body into one of the planes and flew out of Entebbe airport. It was largely a successful raid by all reasonable standards. The mission of the raid had been achieved. Before their departure from Entebbe airport, the Israelis destroyed 11 Soviet belt fighter jets of the Ugandan army, which were parked at the airport. The raid was the first of its kind at the time, and Idi Amin as military president of Uganda never bargained for what became the outcome of the raid. Idi Amin was furious, but despite his anger, the hostages had already been freed and were on their way home beyond the reach of Idi Amin. The entire operation lasted for 90 minutes. More than 40 Ugandan soldiers had been killed in the raid. Idi Amin was extremely and extremely angry. He got to know that Kenya had provided assistance to Israel in the course of the operation, namely allowing Israeli forces to stop over at the Jomo Kenyatta airport to refill their tanks. Idi Amin then ordered the killing of Kenyan nationals that were in Uganda. Several innocent Kenyans who had nothing whatsoever to do with the raid were killed. Others fled the country for fear of their lives. Three hostages lost their lives during the raid, while one, a 75-year-old woman by name Dora Bloch, was killed by Ugandan forces in the hospital in retaliation. The total number of hostages safely taken from Entebbe to Israel was 102. No ransom was paid. No prisoner was released in exchange, as was earlier demanded by the hijackers. The raid of Entebbe International Airport by Israeli Special Forces for the rescue of persons held hostage by hijackers can rightly be described as a high-powered rescue mission carefully planned and expertly executed by the best hands in the Israeli armed forces at the time. Nothing was left undone. Nothing was taken for granted. Everything was taken into consideration. The commandos of the special forces became instant heroes and were lavishly celebrated on their arrival in Israel. It was indeed a successful operation for the Israelis and the operation shall remain in the annals of history for many more years to come. Thanks for watching this edition of Back in History and do remember to subscribe to the channel or follow the page for regular notification on every new video.